Καλησπέρα σα. Καλώ ορίσατε στο Καναδικό Ινστιτούτο στην, στην Ελλάδα. Λέγομαι David Rock, ο διευθυντή. Και σήμερα είναι την ονομαστική γιορτή του Άγιου Πατρίκου. Αλλά είναι. Εγώ είμαι. Έτοιμος It's good to see a lively crowd tonight, um, and uh, you can't, uh, people are not here, cannot say it was because of the traffic, because the traffic somehow is lighter today than it has normally been on uh, Wednesdays, uh, we have discovered. Um, we are, it's March, we are moving through our winter-spring program, and um, I'd like to... Uh, uh, tell you what is coming up in two weeks' time on the 28th, same day, same time, same place. Uh, we have the pleasure of um, uh, Dr. Uh, Artek Lis, who's uh, the Polish Academy of Sciences, who is now the uh, Marie Curie fellow, fellow at the Fitch Laboratory, the BSA, and um, he is somebody who works with us. He's uh, one of the pottery people at our project at Elion with uh, Brendan Burke, uh, UVic, um, which you will hear about in May, more about. And he is going to be talking on migrants in the 12th century BC, a Aegean, a guide to identification. So it's like a field guide. So as you walk around, you'll be able to identify 12th century BC migrants. Um, it should be very interesting in the lecture. He is uh, uh, a pottery person who is uh, branching out. We have added I mean, just at the last moment for Wednesday, May 2nd. Unfortunately, this year, uh, Proto Mayu is on a Tuesday. So, unless you uh, uh, have a very long weekend, uh, uh, we decided to have a lecture on Wednesday, May 2nd. Uh, Professor Emily Bartu, who gave a lecture in the fall uh, from Dalhousie University, uh, will be back. And she's going to be, the title of her talk is Greeks, Romans, and the science of man towards a history of classics and early anthropology. She's been interested in the relationship in the 17th, 18th, uh, 19th century of, uh, mostly more 19th century, of how anthropology as it evolved was influenced by classics and vice versa. And then on Thursday, May 24th, we are going to have our annual meeting. It will be held at the Danish Institute. Uh, unfortunately, I made the prediction last open meeting that it will be held at our new building uh, on Armin Neo Tria, very close by, but we'll, unless a miracle happens, a real miracle, um, it won't be, won't be ready by then. Um, but uh, in any case, we'll have our open meeting. I'll give a report of the work of the Institute in 2017 and 2018, focusing <coughs> on our field work, and our speaker, invited lecturer, is uh, Professor Scott Gallimore, uh, assistant professor in the Department of Archaeology and Classical Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University, also the, the secretary of the board of directors of the institute. And uh, his topic is an island in crisis, question mark, reevaluating the formation of Roman Crete. His uh, specialty is uh, Crete. Uh, in the Roman period, early Roman period. So we're looking forward to uh, these three um, uh, three lectures that are coming up, and uh, and then with uh, with our open meeting, we'll call call it quits. You'll be off the hook until the fall, uh, when we'll have a, another uh, program uh, for you. So this is our uh, what you can look for here on the next. Uh, uh, in two weeks, and then a month after that, and we look forward to your presence. It's uh, always uh, an honor to, uh, in the spring, to have our annual fellow uh, come and give a lecture. 
as part of the, his or her uh, duties, uh, light duties that they are, uh, for the Institute, for the fellowship. And uh, w this year, we've had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, uh, Christopher, Chris uh, Cornthwaite, who is in the front here. You've seen him all since September. Um, and uh, he is a, um, it's probably not often in Athens that there are two people from Timmins, Ontario, in the same room. But we have Chris and another Chris, uh, both from Timmins, both from the uh, resource extraction community of Timmins in northern Ontario. Um, this is where he was born and raised, and uh, he uh, did his uh, undergraduate work at uh, the University of Western Ontario, now called Western. Uh, he did his Bachelor of Arts in uh, History. He then continued on at Western with the Master of Divinity, and uh, then he uh, finished with the Master of Arts there as well. Uh, and his thesis was Torah in the Diaspora, a comparative study of Philo and four Maccab Maccabees. So one of the things we already see is his interest in ancient religion, in the um, uh, Near Eastern or Levantine, and uh, uh, other, other uh, religious uh, groups. He is now finishing up his doctoral dissertation at the University of Toronto, and the title is the dissertation, which we hope you will defend it when you go back uh, in June, um, is entitled The Goddess in the Caravans and the Savior in the, in the Hulls, the Movement of Deities Through Four um, Greco-Roman Diasporas. And so he's interested in this interaction of, of people moving and their uh, religion moving with them. Uh, already he has uh, been publishing articles. Um, he has one coming up in Early Christianity, Letters from Jesus, and Manufacturing Social Capital in Early Christ Groups, uh, which will be coming out this year. Um, he has another article published uh, this past year uh, in the Journal for Judaism, Study of Judaism, Wayward Jews, God-fearing Gentiles, or Curious Pagans, Jewish uh, uh, Normativity and the uh, uh, Sabbathians. Um, he is working on other, other things as well which connect uh, these uh, groups of people. And he's a, a papyri, papyri person and an epigrapher, so uh, pulling this all together. So he has he's been with us working uh, on uh, various aspects of, uh, of the library and also of social media. If you've been watching us on social media, uh, Chris as well as uh, Matt and uh, Katie in the back have uh, pulled us into the, uh, from our rather stay social media present into a much more exciting uh, future. So you can follow us and thank these three individuals uh, for this. It's, um, uh, I'm looking forward, one of the, one of the things I observed uh, in working with Chris is that um, he's a very good writer, and I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to hearing his uh, presentation, which I think will be uh, equally uh, as enthralling as his writing is. So, Chris, come forward. The floor is yours. Congratulations on uh, this big event. Let's, let's hear it. Ah, yes. You gonna have enough light? Good. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you everybody for coming. And uh, I want to say thank you to the Canadian Institute. Because, uh, this has been a really great. I guess I've been here for six months now, six or seven since September. And uh, yeah, a couple months ago still. But, uh, I've been really enjoying my time here and getting to know everybody. So thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah? Okay, yeah. good. Um, so without further ado, we're going to talk about some diaspora stuff tonight. <clears throat> His name is Kawa. I met him this week. He was 18 years old with one of those dirty mustaches that all teenage boys get. He was at the back of a room full of people with his mother and his baby sister, who was 15 months. Nobody was talking to them, so I decided to try. To my surprise, he spoke excellent English, 
and as he told me, not so much Greek. His mother pushed an old stroller full of junk. She didn't speak any English, but she smiled warmly and she stumbled out one word, hello. The beautiful little girl, short, black curly hair and sparkling dark eyes, played with my own little girl on the floor. Once I started to talk to Kawa, he was unguarded and friendly. He talked about learning Greek, and I showed him the app that I try to use, Duolingo. I, I knew that they were refugees. When you live in Athens, you get a pretty good eye for refugees, and I'm sure as everybody knows this now. He told me that they were from Kurdistan, and that they had been in Athens for one year. So we talked for about 15 minutes, and it was on the metro home when I tried to wrangle my own kids that I realized where I had seen the little family before. I had seen them begging on that same metro train, Kawa with his head down, trying to avoid people's gaze. When I began my studies, I started through studying the Jewish diaspora in Alexandria, and I expanded through my PhD to study religion and migration more broadly. Over that time period, a strange transformation seemed to take place in the world. When I would tell people that I was studying religion and migration, instead of responding with a blank stare, or what are you going to do with that, all of a sudden people started to nod and say things like, it's kind of relevant, not something that humanity students are always used to hearing. <clears throat> Migration, of course, has always been all around us. I grew up in a country, Canada, where a few people had anything past great-grandparents that were born there. But migration has a new resonance and urgency, it seems. And as someone who does religious studies, the urgency has a distinctly religi religious component to it. In North America, there are stories whispered of the Islamification of Europe. <coughs> Maybe you've heard of this. I remember one self-styled prophet from my youth predicting that by 2020, France would be a Muslim country. This seems ridiculous to some extent. But the same issues remain at the forefront of the American news cycle and the European elections. Migration has pushed and blurred the lines of ethnicity, race, and religion. And as often has been the case, many see migration as a question of a clash of civilizations. And I think that some of the same issues of modern migration also confront us when dealing with antiquity. So I used to deal with the Jewish diaspora extensively, and then I moved into the study of Christianity, which, although not spread entirely by a Jewish diaspora, certainly owes part of its success to that diaspora. So the question became for me, how does diaspora spread religion, both from a broader theoretical perspective and specifically in antiquity? There are a lot of strong opinions about the Jewish diaspora and the spread of Christianity but I couldn't find much from a comparative perspective to provide a broader sense of how religion moved through diaspora and antiquity. So this became my project, my thesis. I decided to try to create some type of comparative study in ancient diasporas to see how religion moved through them and what role it played in constructing identity. So tonight I'm going to present two of my case studies, the movement of Christianity into Corinth and the movement of a Syrian goddess uh, whose name is Atargatis, um, but she's known by several other Greek epithets. Um, into Delos. My other case studies are Phoenician religions on Delos and the Thracian Bendis cult in Athens for my thesis, but I won't talk about them tonight. So the sources are different. Uh, the comparison is not always perfect. Anybody doing comparative diaspora can imagine. The Syrians on Delos are known to us through inscriptions. The Jews and Christians in Corinth almost exclusively through the writings of the Apostle Paul. But I hope to convince you by the end of this lecture that the comparisons are useful. And I need to say a bit, really quickly, on the lens that I use for my studies. I've been involved in a project that studies Greco-Roman associations, which is a broadly descriptive term for a group that met, usually by choice, around a common family, ethnicity, neighborhood, trade, to worship a deity, <coughs> or often some combination of these things. Since a common homeland was a feature of some of these groups, um, these became diaspora communities that I could study. So from ancient Athens, we see these called, some of the ones around the top there in Greek, fratries, theazoi, synods, and the Kleon. <coughs> the term synagogue was also used for associations, and it became synonymous with Jewish, Jewish gatherings, of course, but there were non-Jewish associations that called themselves synagogues. And the Christian term of preference, uh, of course, is ecclesia, a term borrowed from civic life, but the Christians were also not the only ones to use this term to describe the meetings. Romans had collegia, or collegia, if you prefer, and voluntary social gatherings were not limited to the Greco-Roman societies. In the cultures of the Near East, the West Semitic word Marzea <coughs> is used in Phoenician, Aramaic, Hebrew, and other languages to describe a banqueting institution very similar to those Greek and Roman clubs. So tonight I hope to focus on four <coughs> questions that have been important in my research, 
So first of all, what was the membership profile of these two diaspora religions? What might attract outsiders to worship their gods? How did they preserve home practice? And how did they include outsiders in their practice? My main argument is that the things that we think of under the rubric of religion, usually the veneration of a deity and the rituals associated with that, actually served as entry points for outsiders and helped these two diasporas evolve towards mixed membership, that being mixed in terms of the original ethnos and bringing people in who weren't originally part of that. The other kind of broader hypothesis behind my work is that Christianity wasn't unique in the way that it spread. It operated like other diaspora religions in the way that it constructed space, attracted members, even those outside of the group, and created systems and rituals to allow those former outsiders to become insiders. So we'll start with the Syrian goddess on, on, uh, on Delos. We know quite a bit about the goddess Etargatis, who was also the Syrian goddess. She was known also as the pure goddess or the pure Aphrodite. Part of the reason we know so much about her is because of a wonderful work by Lucian of Samosata, by the same title, the Dea Syria, maybe some of you read it, who records what the worship looked like in the goddess's hometown, Hierapolis in Syria. Lucian's descriptions are fantastic. You really should read it if you haven't read it. Um, one of my favorite stories is of her followers in Syria, who include a group of ascetics called the Galli, who castrate themselves and run around town flinging their genitals into the houses of unsuspecting village folk who throw out women's clothing at them in return. This is stuff we should, we should all be reading, I think. The name Atargatis is likely a compound of Ashtar and Anat, two Near Eastern goddess, goddesses, um, and it appears in Aramaic as Atrata and Atrat. She also goes by Durketo, which is a name that Lucian uses. There were sanctuaries devoted to her around the Near East, including places like Palmyra, Edessa, and Dura Europos. She is often portrayed in iconography as a woman with a fish tail, something like a mermaid, maybe. Um, the abstinence from fish and sacred fish are a central part of her mythology. She had a consort, too, a male deity named Hadad, who occasionally appears along with her, as he does on Delos in a few inscriptions, but he disappeared in time. So here are a few images of her from Dura Europos, too, but these are from centuries later. <clears throat> We have a foundation inscription for the sanctuary on Delos from just before the time when the Romans made Delos a free port in 166 BC. A husband and wife, priest and priestess, Nikon and Onisako, founded it. The inscription marks the formation of a Thiezos in honor of this Syrian goddess. So a Thiezos, as many of you will know, is a bank <coughs> whose members would meet periodically. The Bacchic Rout is probably the best known. But as shown in the introduction, or mentioned, the roots of this diezos go deeper into Near Eastern culture. The Marzeak was a type of a ritual banquet, occasionally held in honor of the dead, for which we have significant and broad evidence. <coughs> One example is the Rosh Shamra tablets, written in Ugaritic from the 14th century BC, which references the Marzeak as types of social banqueting associations. And it includes a fun account of the god El falling over drunk in his own feces. You see the type of things that interest me as a religious studies person. It's kind of weird. The Hebrew Bible mentions Marzaic practice twice, both times disapprovingly, and you can see an example here on your right. Amos 6, verse 4 to 7, the prophet warns of exile for those who take part in the Marzaic. For Syrian immigrants on Delos, as with the Delian Phoenician associations, the Marzaic was an elegant solution to living out a liminal, liminal identity in diaspora, since it was a recognizable Greek form of banqueting that aligned with home practice. We'll see examples in a minute of how the Marzeak was incorporated into the Greek Thiezos. So the sanctuary itself on Delos, I'm not going to say too much about the, uh, the layout or the archaeology of it, um, more just the epigraphy, but the sanctuary itself was, uh, is surrounded by Egyptian sanctuaries. <coughs> so here you can see it uh, positioned beside the Serapion. And it grew remarkably quickly. Most of its growth came in the last two decades of the second century BC. So it grew to include several naoi, and other rooms, as well as a good-sized theater. My first approach <clears throat> was to gain a sense of what membership in the sanctuary was, and to this end I created a database of all the names mentioned in the inscriptions from the sanctuary. There are around 30 short inscriptions that mention benefactors and their families. However, we also have one significant list of people called Therapeutae, which appears in the theater as a list of donors, which has dozens if not hundreds of names on it. It's unfortunately damaged though. So when compiled, the inscriptions give us a list of nearly 217 intact na names of people who worshipped in the sanctuary. 
though this isn't the total number. But 217 names, many of them which also indicate a place of origin, are enough to prompt some questions about the nature of membership in the sanctuary and its role within the wider trading activities happening on Delos. So first of all, these are the membership questions I've asked, and I'll apply the same questions to Corinth in a minute. So where did members come from? Both of the sanctuaries, as, as we will see, brought in people from around the Mediterranean and were focal points for some sort of international network, probably a trade network. Uh, secondly, what was the ethnic mix of the people in the sanctuary? Since it's clear that the Syrian sanctuary attracted some outsiders, who were they? And finally, third, the other division seems to be social status. So I'd like to know if we can say anything about the social status of members. The first thing that the database shows, my database, and I'm not going to show it to you, I'm just going to talk about it. I think that would be pretty boring. Um, but the first thing it shows, not surprisingly, is that Syrian families are the backbone of the sanctuary. So here I've recreated one just for fun. You don't have to read it too closely. But um, it's not a perfect recreation. Some of my links might be wrong. But it at, very le it at the least shows that there are Syrian families who are present in the sanctuary for generations. And we've got three or four families that kind of look like this. So there are some big families at the backbone of the sanctuary. But I'm actually more interested in the apparent outsiders who worship in, in the sanctuary. I should say, too, that I say the word members a lot, but I use this loosely. Uh, there's no way to know if the people mentioned in inscriptions had any kind of genuine or relationship <coughs> to the sanctuary. Because the fact is that although there were certainly immigrants from Syria worshipping there, the goddess attracted people who were not Syrian, probably including some high-status freeborn Romans. I've broken all these people into the following categories. <clears throat> so people are divided by place of origin rather than by ethnos, and then by Roman names. There were, not surprisingly, a large group from Hellenistic Syria. I suspect that most of these people identified as Syrian by ethnos. Many of these were low-level traders and Greek, not Greek aristocracy. Um, and also the Aramaic language appears at the sanctuary, as I'll talk about below. But nevertheless, these people almost universally have Greek names, the people from Syria. There are also a lot of members from the Greek mainland, mostly from Attica. Around 112 BC, the city of Athens took over the administration of the sanctuary, which included the selection of the yearly priests. So from this point on, there was an increase in Athenians in the sanctuary, although there were a handful of Athenians who participated before this. And these Athenians also brought friends and family with them. Now the Romans. The Romans are more difficult to parse. Obviously a Roman name doesn't say anything about origins, and we almost never have a place of origin mentioned with the Roman name. So on the one hand, many of the Romans were certainly from the Levant, uh, probably were slaves or freedmen, and I'll say more about this in a minute. But let me just say for now that a Roman, a Roman name on Delos doesn't really tell us very much about the person who has it. So of a total of 217 members of the sanctuary, 55 are from Greece, it's about 25%, 2 are Phoenicians, 1%, 23 bear Roman names, um, of which 3 are from Athens and Deansmen, which is kind of interesting, that's 10%. 45 are of Syrian origin, 20%, and 93 are unknown, so about 42%. And universally, other than the Roman names, everybody has a Greek name. So even with this basic information, an interesting question occurs to me as somebody who studies ethnicity and diaspora. It's typical to call the Syrian sanctuary, and some like it, an ethnic sanctuary. But is it right to call it such if only one in five people are demonstrably from Syria? I don't have the answer to this, but I think it's important to think about. It's likely that many, if not most, probably were, but I think certainly some were not. And in any case, when we graph the places of origin of all the names which have a city attached to them, so something like Demetrius, son of Demetrius, from Damascus, um, we get the following network map for the sanctuary. I'm going to call this a trading network of all the people who are connected to the Syrian sanctuary. The sanctuary had connections to people from Naples, Ephesus, and one from Alexandria. In fact, the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess sat in the middle of a trans-Mediterranean trading network, as of course did most of the sanctuaries on Delos. And I also, you can't, I don't have Rome marked here, because as I said, the Romans, it's impossible to tell where they're from, but maybe some are from Rome too. What I think we can say for now is that the Syrian sanctuary on Delos had Syrian families at its core, and perhaps some Syrian slaves and freedmen as well but it also attracted a wide variety of members and served as a hub for an international trade group, on which I'll say more below. But first, let's go to Corinth for a minute. <clears throat> so obviously Corinth is similar to Delos in some ways, although Christianity came to Corinth over a century later. Like Delos, it was a trade hub. It enjoyed a revitalization of its former glory after the Romans refounded the city in 44 BC. 
When we deal with the entry of Christianity into Corinth, we are inevitably dealing with the Apostle Paul, about whom the legends probably eclipse reality in his writings. In fact, we know very little about the founding of Christianity in Corinth, other than an account from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And since Acts was written decades after Paul wrote his own letters, and stories about Paul grew in importance as he grew in importance, they uh, were exaggerated maybe, uh, maybe this should be taken with a grain of salt. But if you're rapidly trying to read that, you don't have to. I'll sum it up here. It tells us three things, I think, which are probably accurate. So first of all, there was an existing Jewish synagogue at Corinth um, when Paul got there, apparently made up of Jews and Greeks. Secondly, there were non-Jews worshipping or sympathizing in some way with the Jewish God, whoever these people were. The book of Acts often calls them God-fearers. And third, Paul is involved in some sort of business network, too, which is kind of interesting. So immediately, I was struck when I was researching this by some comparisons to the sanctuary on Delos, in which we also have this kind of ethnic core worshipping a national god, outsiders who come in and worship that god, too, um, and some connection to business. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves yet. <clears throat> so as I said, one of the difficulties in speaking of early Christianity is wading through the legends of Paul that emerge later. It's been fairly recognized, or sorry, there has been a fairly recognized story about Paul's founding of the church, including in Corinth, and it goes something like this. The Apostle Paul single-handedly created a Christian church, not just in Corinth, but for our purposes in Corinth, and he decides to convert Gentiles to Christianity against everyone else's better judgment. This narrative is ingrained in many of our imaginations about the spread of early Christianity. Um, but even in Paul's letters, we see a little bit of a different story. So first of all, Paul was one of many teachers and preachers in Corinth. He often acknowledges or even tries to discredit others who clearly had factions of the church following them. One of these, Apollos, was a Jew from Alexandria. Another was the Apostle Peter, known as Cephas. Uh, and elsewhere in the letter, Paul acknowledges other people. So even by the time he wrote his first Corinthian correspondence, and the, the first book of Corinthians in the New Testament is actually the second book, because there was an earlier letter that's lost, but anyways, um, Paul's following was only a fragment of the larger Corinthian church. Likewise, in Paul's letters, <coughs> Paul has a constant struggle to try to gain respect. He didn't have much authority, and he's always struggling for control and position. So here, just a little excerpt of... Uh, what he says at one point. He says, are we beginning to commend ourselves to you again? Surely we don't need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you, do we? So he's always trying to show that he's better than other teachers. He's always trying to, uh, to pull his own credentials, which is not necessarily something you need to do if you're kind of the established leader of the community. So he's fighting to work his way up. And at one point, Paul is apparently brought into some type of judgment by the community, who are impressed by his strong letters, but underwhelmed by his physical appearance, or so he says. So if we read his letters carefully, and we kind of read against the grain a little bit, we can see that they employ tactics that Paul uses to gain respect and authority. His status grows over time, which is obvious, obviously where the triumphant narrative of Acts comes from, because after all, history is written by the winners. Therefore, his earlier letters show someone who is not quite so bold and sure of his authority. Rather, they present a young, uncertain, itinerant preacher, trying his best to keep his head afloat in a Corinthian community that already had several respected teachers. So maybe we need to rewrite the story. The reality, I think, looks a little more ordinary, but also a little more like what we see with the other diaspora, uh, diaspora communities, like the Syrian goddess on Delos. It seems that Paul entered an existing network with significant trade component, and a significant amount of Jews, of course, but not exclusively Jews. He was not the first, nor the only preacher to bring Christianity to Corinth, but over a long process, he worked his way to the top and became dominant. And the community at Corinth was mixed, although I have some doubts that this was actually Paul's idea. Many other diaspora associations attracted outsiders and moved to mixed membership, as, as uh, they did on Delos. So in any case, we know the Corinthian church was made up of a mixture of people. And of course, the most well-known division is Jews and Gentiles. Um, Paul at various times references those who are Gentiles, as well as those whose ancestors wandered in the desert. And some of the hot topics are around the Jewish food laws and circumcision, as we'll see in a minute. <clears throat> but if we chart the names from Paul's letters that he mentions in relation to Corinth, excuse me, we see a familiar breakdown. The Romans, of course, have the same problem with the Roman names on Delos. Uh, it's rarely clear where they come from or their status. They don't ever get nomina with them. In the Corinthian church, as with the Syrian sanctuary on Delos, we seem to have a trifecta of people 
from the original homeland of the god or goddess, um, and also Christ, which I know this is a bit different thing, but I'll say more about that in a minute. Not surprisingly, people who fall somewhere in between these categories and probably don't fit really nicely into any of them. In both cases, these indicators say little about their ethnic identity, except for those people who are obviously called Judeans. <clears throat> and finally, there's some kind of network behind Paul and his community. Of course, we might imagine that Paul founded this during his so-called missionary journeys, but the network seems to be a little bit bigger than Paul. He's not the only one who travels. In fact, it seems possible that he entered an existing trust network um, that was there before the birth, birth of Christianity, likely a trade network, and worked his way up as an influencer, much like some of us young scholars are currently trying to do in the academy. The glimpses of his network that we see in his letters suggest that it was vast and well-connected, <clears throat> an effective channel through which Christianity could spread. And it was a trans-Mediterranean network. Its members enjoyed tremendous mobility. Paul's letters report moving from Ephesus to Cancrea to Corinth to Rome and back to Jerusalem. Uh, and this includes other people like Chloe, a person of higher status who travels on, uh, who has people who travel on her behalf, Timothy, Apollos, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Nicacus. When we map out the places traveled in Paul's letters, omitting Acts, which I've done, I've omitted Acts here, we get a network that looks something like this. <coughs> As a network of trust, it was large enough to require letters of introduction when somebody traveled, indicating that the members did not all know each other on a face-to-face -face basis. It seems that this was probably not a network uh, created from budding church communities, connected through Paul's leadership, but rather a well-connected trade and business network which enabled the flow of Christianity towards Rome. So both the Syrian Sanctuary on Delos and the Corinthian church, I think I'm going to say, existed in some type of similar, similarly structured trade network. You can fight me with that after if you want. <clears throat> so I've therefore suggested three points of similarity between the Delian and the Corinthian groups so far. An ethnic core, a mixed membership that included outsiders, and both took advantage of an international trade network. I'll talk in a minute about the Delian trade network. Unfortunately though, I should just say right now, before I get too far ahead of myself, um, that I don't actually know if Christians were trading directly or if they were just benefiting from a trade network being there, uh, such as the mobility and connections that it offered. But in any case, the, the comparison is interesting. So I'd like to move now to the question of attracting outsiders. How and why did both groups attract people from outside their ethnic base who would come to worship their national gods? So first of all, the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess. I already mentioned why Athenians came into the sanctuary. The priests were Athenians, and they brought their friends and family with them. But I want to talk for a minute about the high-class members of the, the sanctuary, a group that I call Friends and Romans. So first of all, the Friends. We can start with the dedication of a statue base. I don't have a picture of the base. I'm sorry, I just have the text, but hopefully that's all right. Um, this is from 106-105 BC, when a new priest by the name of Zoilos, son of Zoilos, from the Fleadim, took over the priesthood of the Syrian goddess. So as was fairly common, he gave a gift to the sanctuary and dedicated an unknown building to the people of Athens and Rome. But what comes next, I think, is fairly remarkable. He adds an extra name in here, a person who he calls a friend. Midas, the son of Zenon, from Heraclea. We don't know a lot about Midas, although he's probably from Heraclea on the south coast of Anatolia. And he was apparently well connected on Delos. We have a bench that was dedicated in the Italian Agora with his name on it. But lest we imagine that Zoilos is just kind of being a sycophant here, doesn't actually know this Midas and is just sucking up to a well-connected resident on Delos, this inscription prompts another inscription later in the same year. Who should appear? but this Midas himself. Reasonably, I think, reconstructed in this inscription, he turns out to be a generous benefactor. He dedicates the hall, the supplies for the roof colonnade, and the house. But lest we think the bonds of friendship end here, in his dedication, um, he calls out another friend of his, a well-connected and well-known resident of Delos, a Phoenician banking aristocrat, uh, Philostratus from Ascalon. I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't hold it there, but you can see it about seven lines down. <clears throat> Philostratus had already made an appearance as a donor elsewhere in the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess, so we know that he was also connected there. What these inscriptions point to, I think, is that by the late 2nd century, a network of wealthy friends had taken up the cause of the sanctuary, and the epigraphy shows that the social capital drew together some very wealthy Delians. But we can take this a step further. As I mentioned before, we have 23 names of Romans on the dedications of the sanctuary, which make up a total of 11% of the members there.
The vast majority of these came at the end of the second century BC. As I've said, Roman names are difficult to parse on Delos because of naming practices. Names like Gaius, who's a son or freedman of Gaius, doesn't really tell us very much, since the genitive could be used to show either filiation or freed status. Um, it seems to be a way that some Romans in the second century BC in both Delos, and we see the same thing in Athens, work to adapt to a Greek environment, but unfortunately it makes people kind of disappear because we don't know much about them. But let's talk about Romans in class. So I've already, as I've already said, most of the Romans are probably freedmen and slaves. The best proof of this is the dedication of a freedman to his mother at the sanctuary. <clears throat> in this example, a man with a Roman name and a Greek-sounding cognomen was a freedman from the Levant, confirmed by another inscription on Delos, which commemorates his moment of freedom as well as his patron. So presumably for this Roman, part of the attraction of, to Atragatis lay in his Syro-Phoenician roots. Unfortunately, we can't trace any of the other Romans in the sanctuary this clearly, and we're left to piece together small clues of who they might have been uh, and what their role on Delos was. Now, it can be said that several of the Roman names in the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess also appear in the Roman collegia of the island. This is interesting but difficult to interpret further since the collegia, I keeps going back and forth with the pronunciations, forgive me, but the collegia had notoriously mixed membership. <coughs> But despite many Romans with an ambiguous status, the dedications to Atragatis carry the nomina of some of the most powerful people on Delos. These are people like Publius Aemilius, a son or a freedman of Lucius, a Roman. He was from the family Aemilii, who were patricians, and this family had been celebrated on Delos for generations. In the second century BC, at least two of the Aemilii on the island had been consuls. Another example of connections to a powerful family is the presence of the name, though partially reconstructed, Quintus Tullius, in a list of Therapeutae from the theater. Tullius was an important Roman name from antiquity. It was actually Cicero's nomen. So in short, of the senatorial families on Delos, at least three are represented in the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess. <coughs> Nomina include Amelia, uh, excuse me, Ignati and Tulli. What's more, another three of the families represented in the sanctuary would achieve senatorial status shortly after their activity on Delos, whatever that was. These include the families Gessi, Sei, and Felusi. Even if these are slaves, and incidentally I don't think they all are, they are connected to remarkably influential and powerful Roman families. So before moving on to the question of social status among the Corinthian church, let me pause on the question of why some of the wealthiest members of Delos might be interested in the sanctuary of a relatively obscure Syrian goddess. So I don't know for sure, but I'm going to just speculate wildly for a minute, so stay with me. Um, as we've seen, the sanctuary of Atargatis was a focal point in a trans-Mediterranean trade route. But let's zoom again on the city that started it all, and I have a pointer here somewhere. I don't know where I'm at. It doesn't matter. Yes. Um, on the, by the screen. Oh, that's right. Anyway, so um, right up over here, this is Hierapolis in Syria. Right so. It was from here that the founders of the sanctuary on Delos immigrated, founding it around 166 BCE, you'll remember. But the phenomenal growth and frenetic donations from friends and Romans to the Syrian sanctuary on Delos came in the closing decades of the second century BC. So let's pause for a moment to consider the description of the city of Hierapolis in Syria from Strabo more than a century later. He says, and I'm just going to read the part that's bolded here, the road for merchants going from Syria to Seleucia and Babylon lies through the country of the Arabian Sinite, now called Mali, and through the desert belonging to their territory. The Euphrates is crossed in the latitude of Anthemusia, a place in Mesopotamia. Above the river, at the distance of four Shuni, is Bambike, which is called by the names of Edessa and Hierapolis, where the Syrian goddess Atargatis is worshipped. It's interesting here that Strabo's mention of Hierapolis as the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess is merely an addendum. What he's much more interested in is Hierapolis' position on a trade route. And its position on this trade route is unique, and perhaps tells us why Romans might have suddenly been so interested in the sanctuary of Delos. The rapid growth of the Delian sanctuary came after 120 BC. It roughly coincides with two major events in the east. In the first place, the reigning Seleucids in Syria lost all of their territory east of the Euphrates to Mithridates I of Parthia. This growth and consolidation of the Parthian Empire redrew the boundaries between it and the Seleucid Empire. You can see the Parthian Empire here in the red on the map. The city of Hierapolis, where the Syrian goddess come, uh, came from, 
was no longer in the middle of Hellenistic Syria. It was now on the Parthian border. The city formerly in the center of Syria had now become the frontier. Secondly, and most importantly, this meant that Herapolis was the easiest place from which to access the trading markets of the east. Palmyra had not yet risen to its prominent role, which is why I've left the link off here. Um, that would come a little bit later in the first century with advances in caravan technology to get across the desert there. Um, but as you can see, I've left, sorry, I've left the link off. The Persian Royal Road, that famous trade route that followed the Euphrates down to India, culminated at Hierapolis. Furthermore, in the middle of the second century BC, the first connections in the new Silk Road were being formed and stabilized, especially the overland route across the Tarim Basin. You can see the Silk Route coming in in the orange here. This means that one of the main and earliest arteries of the so-called Silk Road <coughs> was this road through Hierapolis. So for half a century, Hierapolis, the city of Atargatis, was the site par excellence from which to access the trading groups coming through the Parthian Empire. The exact time period when everybody became so interested in a sanctuary of a little Syrian goddess on Delos. I suspect, I suspect this is the reason why these Hierapolitans made such a buzz on Delos and why so many wealthy Delians were attracted to them. It was likely because of their connections across the shaky Seleucid realm to the border of Parthia. The appearance, the appearance of sanctuaries of Atargatis and the other major trade cities, Edessa, Dura, Europos, and Palmyra, and here in blue I've marked cities with the Atargatis sanctuary. This is not an exclusive list, just a couple of the main ones. <clears throat> so the occurrence of these sanctuaries in the later centuries confirms to me that the, uh, the sanctuary on Delos was actually solidifying the trust of a long distance trading network. But let's go back to Corinth for a minute. <clears throat> the main question around outsiders, specifically Gentiles, who worship Christ in the Corinthian church, is whether it was specifically Paul's mission and intent to bring in the Gentiles, or whether he was kind of just dealing with the reality he found on the ground, namely a mixed community that already had non-Jews worshiping the Jewish God. So in other words, the question is, did Paul plan to bring in outsiders, or did he have to adapt to the reality that they were already there? I don't know the answer to this. Um, I suggested above, and I think it's probably mixed before Paul got there, but this is just a speculation. The example of the Syrian goddess on Delos tells us that mixed communities could and did spring up around a deity of a cultural homeland. My thesis records two other examples of these, but we have dozens. <coughs> it's difficult to know what attracted outsiders to Christianity, but the approach Paul takes in his letters towards difference in the Corinthian church, as he does elsewhere, is to create a Christianity that minimizes ethnic practices, most notably circumcision and food laws, although he does still require monotheism. This evolution certainly made it easier for outsiders to become a part of it. And his strategy for dealing with difference, personally, was famously to become all things to all people. So again, whether this strategy was Paul's vision or whether it was reacting to the reality of people already worshipping the Jewish God and subsequently uh, Jesus Christ, I do not know. But Paul minimizes divisions and ethnic requirements and envisions a Christianity as well as his own persona that operates as a kind of low and lowest common denominator of cultural practice. So no matter how attracted people were to Christianity, there's a question of what the social status <clears throat> of Corinthian Christians was. On the one hand, there's a bulk of agreement that the Corinthian church stressed, stretched across social status, um, strata, with the bulk of membership probably being towards the bottom of the social ladder. But there remains a question of how high into the social strata the early Christian movement could reach, especially with the apparent mention of some elites in Paul's letters. One example of an issue in this discussion of how high early Christianity could reach is the discussion of a figure named Erastus, who is mentioned in Romans 16 uh, in a list of people from Corinth. Erastus is called the oikonomos of the city, probably a city treasurer or planner of some sort. And when an inscription was discovered in Corinth on a giant paving stone east of the theater that bore the same name, it was happily proclaimed that we had found the Erastus of the New Testament, who was here referred to by the Latin title of Adile. And forgive my uh, cell phone picture of this. <clears throat> but alas, it was not meant to be. I think it's been well established now that the name actually belongs to the second century. This paving stone is set over an early second century latrine. And all of this is laid out, if you care to read it, um, very well by Stephen Friesen in a chapter called The Wrong Erastus, as indeed it seems he is. But the issue of how important, if at all, early Christians were in Corinth, Corinthian society, remains. And in many ways we really don't know. 
A church member named Chloe has people who travel on her behalf. I mentioned that above. Uh, there's a Phoebe who is a deacon at King Cray and who is a benefactor of Paul's traveling with his letter to Rome. Someone named Gaius perhaps played host to the entire church. But none of these things really tell us anything concrete about the social status of these members. So in the end, really, perhaps we can say very little um, from the comparison. But I would say the Delian comparison gives us a little more data, perhaps, not on what was the reality in Corinth, but what was possible, about what type of members a cult from the Levant could attract. But I don't think we can simply assume that Christianity only attracted low-level slaves and freedmen. Basically, we just never know. We have no idea how influential the trading network was that the Apostle Paul moved in. <clears throat> so the comparisons in this section are far from perfect, but I would suggest that both communities, bringing in outsiders, was a common occurrence, and some of these may have been elites or connected to elite families. <clears throat> but for the last few minutes, I'd like to take a little bit different direction, and I want to talk a little bit more about uh, diaspora practice. So since my thesis draws extensively on diaspora theory, one of the critical things to recognize is how diaspora communities incorporate and preserve parts of home and how they acculturate and adapt to a new environment. In addition to this, my research into outsiders coming in looks at rituals of trust as those social patterns that help to make new members fit into place. So I really like Stuart Hall's definition of hybridity here. He's a famous diaspora theorist. Diasporas, diasporas does not refer us, sorry, that's a typo, diaspora does not refer us to those scattered tribes whose identity is secured in relation to some sacred homeland to which they must at all costs return, even if it means pushing other people into the sea. This is the old, the imperializing, the hegemonizing form of ethnicity. The diaspora experience as I intended here is defined not by essence or purity, but by the recognition of a necessary heterogeneity and diversity, by a concept of identity which lives with and through, not despite, difference, by hybridity. So hybridity then is the ways in which diaspora communities create new space and, and ways of being often through combining new with the old. So of course, elements of home worship appear, appear in many cults of foreign gods, and the Syrian goddess was no exception. As I mentioned above, Marzaic practices were a bridging of the old and the new of sorts. Um, but we can also see the preservation and reinvention of home practices in the Syrian sanctuary through an inscription that outlines the requirements for worshippers coming into the sanctuary. These requirements seem to show an ad adaptation of purity rules at the Temple of Hierapolis. Lucian reports that the followers at the temple there had to abstain from fish altogether. After all, fish were sacred in the temple of Etargatis. Here we have what is probably a local reality influencing Etargatis worship on Delos. It's one thing to abstain from fish in the wilderness city of Hierapolis in Syria, but probably an altogether different matter to abstain from fish in the tiny island of Delos. <coughs> so, it gets adapted, and now it's wait three days, then you can go to the sanctuary. Also, some of the ecstatic and oracular practices from Hierapolis were recreated on Delos. Um, here, I just, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a bronze ear that's affixed to the side of, uh, to the side of a, a, what is it, I don't remember if it is, a basin or something. Um, and this is something we see in the Egyptian sanctuaries too. So there's an importance of having a god or goddess who hears and who can actually listen. And that's why we start to see these ears in some of the archaeological remains. Um, but Lucian also reports um, that at Hierapolis, the priests of Atargatis received divine orders from the goddess in various ways. The cultic statues would sweat and jerk around to tell the priests what they wanted. So something like this must have happened on Delos too. Many benefactors indicate in their dedications that the gift that they were giving came cataprostagma, you can see it there, bolded, according to divine command. This suggests that the practice of the goddess giving instructions to her followers by supernatural methods continued on Delos. And one more example of an adopted home practice. Before the Athenian takeover of the priesthood, the priests were elected by hands. This is shown in Greek by the verb kerotoneo. <clears throat> we have an example of it here as the perfect participle in the inscription. And this word is used to describe choosing of officers in Greek civic life for sure, which is not a strange word to us. But in Marseille practice, the election by hands also has a supernatural component to it. The choosing was considered to be done by the hand of the divinity. So through these things, banqueting practices, ritual purity, and maintaining the oracular function of the gods, the Syrian context could be brought to the Greek. <clears throat> but the other thing that brings in and preserves home identity in a new context is language. <clears throat> 
And in the Delian Sanctuary, we see the adaptation of Aramaic words into Greek as loan words. So one of these, carved on the side of a marble drum base for something, uh, reads Ton Nemeran, you can see it here, folded. <coughs> Unfortunately, whatever was on that drum base was long gone, but it seemed to be one of two things, either of which show the adaptation of the Aramaic word Nemar and Nemara. In the first place, the word can be translated as brilliance. This has led to one school of thought that the pedestal on Delos held a crown or some headpiece for the goddess, which appears in some of the coins from Herapolis. Otherwise, it is probable that Ton Namaran was actually a candle. And here you can kind of see a recreation. This is the base, and then that's what it would look like. This is done by Ernst Bill in his uh, famous study of the Syrian goddess in the sanctuary there. Um, Ton Namaran was probably a candle in this case, and it bears a similarity to a word that we're probably all familiar with uh, from the context of Hanukkah, uh, the menorah, Namaran menorah. <coughs> And another Aramaic loan word for one of the ritual places in the sanctuary appears in a Greek dedicatory inscription as ton egan. Egan? Egan. Pardon my pronunciation. I alternate between ancient Greek that I learned and modern Greek that I'm learning. Um, <laughs> card beside, so this is card beside some type of cistern. The word is an adaptation into Greek of the Aramaic word agana, a term for a basin or a pool of water. This was likely a sacred fish pond of which we have examples in other sanctuaries of Atargatis. So there are other examples of the Aramaic language, but I'm not going to list them all here. But suffice it to say, the new ritual context on Delos was imbued with the Aramaic language. I don't know whether this means that a significant amount of the population there spoke Aramaic, uh, is very possible, or whether the words were retained, like the old Latin maybe in the Catholic churches, long after people stopped speaking the language, Yet, for whatever reasons, these ritual words in Aramaic were important enough to preserve in a type of transcription, rather than to translate them. And they're an interesting example of the preservation of home in a diasporic setting. As an aside, I should say that the use of Hebrew language is not really something we see in Corinth, at least in Paul's letters, but of course, uh, it's popular elsewhere in Christianity. So words like hallelujah come into common use in the New Testament and later and maybe the transcriptions of Jesus, Aramaic, in the Gospels, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which he says from the cross, um, you kind of get this adoption of a, a kind of word-for-word -word, uh, recreation of one language in another, which is really neat. <clears throat> but for the many cases where home identity was preserved, the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess on Delos was distinctly Greek in its form, and it became more, soon, more so over time. If anything, the remnants of the Syrian culture likely added to the exoticism of those coming in, but a Greek veneer was placed over the sanctuary. The cultic structure was given a Greek flavor. We can see this in the roles of the temple overseers, which I have listed here. Uh, they're given the standard offices of a lot of different Greek temples. So from the adaptation and preservation of home practices, the sanctuary shows hybridity. New ritual forms of worship were created. Um, here is uh, another kind of evolution, is the evolution in the iconography of the god. <coughs> it's on the iconography of, um, of Aphrodite. And also you get a little more nudity, which is not really common um, in, the, in the home place. So, new rituals and forms were created, and we get this hybridity happening. <clears throat> Since my work is so focused on how outsiders came in, I'd like to discuss one last set of rituals, uh, ritual practices that I call rituals of trust. <coughs> this is borrowed from Charles Tilley's idea of trust networks. Rituals of trust, as I understand them, are those social and religious rituals which bound together participants in a sanctuary who, as we have already seen, were quite diverse. One of the most important and visual rituals in our sources is the practice, practice of ritualized giving. This is visible to us because these are the exact moments that the inscriptions were usually created to capture. I talked about this above, so I won't say too much here, but let me say that ritualized giving, especially in the forms of buildings and the cultic necessities, was a way that trust and partnership was created, and outsiders could endear themselves to a sanctuary. Another ritual of trust that we know about, but we don't know too much about, was the parade. Of course, we know that processions were important elsewhere, and actually one of the other groups I study, um, the Bendis followers in Athens, had a parade that went between Athens and the Piraeus, uh, which was a very important part of uh, kind of blending with the Athenians. <clears throat> um, but in this case, so in this case, parading brought different groups together and solidified them across difference. So there was some procession in the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess, uh, we have a list here of people involved in it. Again, I haven't given you a picture of the inscription, but this occurs 
within the context of a huge list of names, and this is kind of a subset of the list of donors, and you can see here the donation is all the same, for drachma. Um, and these are the names. They all appear under this Greek word of bastikes, which is from bastazo, in Greek, meaning something like to carry. <clears throat> so, in the Marseille cult culture, a procession would include a group of people who carried some sort of sacred object sacred fire, water, or perhaps, and probably here, the image of a deity. In the same way, this list of people, called the Bastiges, <coughs> carriers, carried something in the procession in the Delian sanctuary, probably a cultic image of the goddess, because we have other inscriptions that mention it being dedicated and, and built um, at different times, and some of them are small, apparently. So the donation of four drachma here is standard. But the list shows quite a variety in terms of the names of the people who are, uh, who are there. You see some Roman names, you see some names with no, um, no surname in the Greek, um, you see some cultic functions here, this is Gorgias Zacharos, so, so uh, this is a cultic function. <clears throat> so I would suggest that this, this uh, practice is serving to draw different people together from different backgrounds. <clears throat> there was also, of course, an element of ritual banqueting in the Delos sanctuary but we don't know too much about this either. We only have references to a few Thiesatai, and a potential reference to a triclinium, which I put here. Um, this inscription has an unknown word in it. You can see here, this is kind of a, a recreation into the Greek. Um, some people have, have thought that this, this word is from the Aramaic uh, derivan, um, which means something like a triclinium, um, so like a banqueting hall. I'm a little bit hesitant to accept this, since the other adaptations of Aramaic words usually are a little more straightforward and come with a definite article in Greek, but it is possible. It's also possible that it's the name of a deity that we don't know about. Um, in any case, it's clear that the ritual banqueting was important in the sanctuary, um, but we just can't completely see it because of our sources. But here we do have this lovely carving of the Marzea, which is from the sanctuary too. So finally, back to Corinth for one more minute. Uh, we can see the preservation of home practices to some extent by the Jewish diaspora in Corinth that would host Christianity. Often these come in the form of people Paul is railing against in his letters. So I'm going to fly through these pretty quickly. There have been tomes and tomes written on each of the subjects, so it's probably a bit reductionist. But studying it from a comparative diasporic um, perspective, I think, allows us to at least recognize the role that different cultural practices like circumcision, food laws, baptism, could have in creating diasporic identities. And these are the things that people write a lot of books about, about the theology and the meaning of these types of things. But anyways. So Paul talks about circumcision a little bit. I put a little excerpt, excerpt here where he talks about circumcision. <coughs> it's mainly in reference to not changing one's status. But the thing that seems to have really been a hot topic in Corinth is the issue of eating food offered to idols, counter to Jewish dietary laws. Paul says that it's okay to eat food offered to idols, um, but the fact that this is even an issue, to me, shows that there are Jews in the Corinthian group who are still observing Jewish food laws, quite insistent on this. So in this, we have somebody keeping a home tradition alive. Likewise, I think in some ways, baptism, too, is a preservation of the Jewish practice of ritual washing. Even before Christianity, baptism was some re sometimes required for Jewish uh, converts, sorry, Gentile converts to Judaism. The Jewish ritual washing was based around the mikveh. So here, this is a picture of mikvot at Qumran. <clears throat> baptism in Christianity is probably drawn in part from the ritual washing of the mikvah, but not exclusively. But the Christian baptism doesn't directly draw from this. It evolves, too. So Paul's own theology of baptism we can also see evolving over time. Uh, we don't see much in his letters to the Corinthians, but in a letter to the Romans, which was written later, when his theology was more developed, he spends a lot more time talking about baptism. So I won't say too much about accommodation because I already have above. Paul's whole approach to Christianity is accommodation. Everything is meant to adapt it to make it easier for outsiders to follow, and a lot of the Jewish practices, to the extent that they were in Paul's group, slip away. So finally, I'd like to talk about rituals of trust in Corinth, how they work to create unity and harmony across divisions like Jews and Gentiles or rich and poor. Although we must be cautious to read behind what Paul says about his communities, it is clear that there were some sort of divisions among them, likely as a result of different factions or groups gathering around different leaders or teachers, of which, as I said, Paul was only one. We can see this here. The nice thing about having a literary source, like we do in the Corinthians, is that we can see some of the challenges to unity and how they're overcome, which we obviously don't have for the sanctuary of Atargatis. 
The most obvious ritual of trust, which we're all familiar with, is a ritual meal. Uh, we'll call it communion, maybe, which seems to have been a point of contention. So at one point, Paul complains that people are coming together, eating at different times. Someone's eating at home, someone else is getting drunk, uh, somebody's eating in small groups, and somebody's not getting any. And in pointing this out, Paul is acknowledging the effect that the meal is supposed to have. As a ritual of trust, it's supposed to bring the group together to create unity. But as he says, it's not serving its purpose. It's important to notice that the social difference that this meal is meant to overcome is not that of ethnicity, as in between Jews and Gentiles, but the gaps in between rich and poor seem more significant. Some members of the group are going hungry. And finally, this is one of the ones I'm really interested in, I'd like to highlight one more ritual of trust from early Christianity. You can probably think of a few more if you're at all familiar with even modern Christianity. <coughs> the practice of taking up a collection for Jerusalem is a fascinating ritual of trust that, despite mountains of scholarly work, still needs a great deal of explanation. Unfortunately, I can't offer this, but just for a minute, try to imagine what on earth would possess a non-Jew sitting in Corinth in the Corinthian church to give money to the Jerusalem church, a Jewish body on the other side of the Mediterranean, which they had presumably never had any contact with, other than some leaders going back and forth. This is actually one of the most interesting mysteries to me in early Christianity. And since Paul spends a lot of his time in his letters begging, cajoling, and even acknowledging that the offering didn't always work, it seems unlikely that Paul's status alone warranted people giving this money when they gave. Of course, it's no mystery why Paul himself would want people to give. When he came back to Jerusalem carrying all this money from the diaspora, um, obviously he would become an important contact person, and this would legitimize his own person and uh, ministry. But the questions of why Gentiles might have funded this, to me, is unanswerable. So I'd just like to make a couple of quick conclusions. First of all, we have, and I've seen uh, between the two groups, we have diaspora communities who are based on people from a shared homeland worshipping a shared national god or goddess. We have people who preserve and adapt homeland practices to their new environments, people who establish contacts outside of their ethnic group, perhaps for trade, ethnic outsiders would come to worship national gods, and rituals of trust created unity across difference. So I hope that I've shown that even with different material evidence, we can see similar concerns across diaspora communities, even if things don't line up perfectly, and similar phenomena occurring. We have places of worship created, created around ethnic gods, but they become the place where people came and the bonds of trade were made and new identities were formed. Hybridity. And what's more, the role of what we would call religion, in this case the rituals and worship of a homeland deity, became bridges through which outsiders could enter a community. I have always wondered about the dis one distinction that Paul makes there between the Israelites and the Hebrews and the Jews. And since your paper was also about ethnicity, I kind of had hoped that you would say something about uh, this. <laughs> um, I don't know <laughs> if I get the answer. I mean, I know a little bit, I've read a little bit, but my work doesn't really talk too much about it because in, in my field, the issue has now evolved because of this word Judeoi, which uh, the Greek word for what like, is translated as Judaism, but it is now pretty much recognized that it's not the Jewish religion it's talking about. It's something like ethnicity, but it's ethnicity that includes religion. So it's not it's not ethnicity at the expense of a national god. It's kind of all wrapped together. Um, but as far as so I, I I know there's that, but then as far as like the uses of Hebrew and and, and Paul talking about in Romans, I know he talks a lot about those type of things. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. I, I wish I knew a little more about it, but I'll refrain from saying too much. Um, so, yeah, sorry, that's not, not much help. Yeah, because it was one of the quotes you had on the, you know, there was, are the yeah, Israelites, right. are the Hebrews, see, so yeah. it was, that was kind of what I was uh, thinking about. But yeah. just another proposal then to the last uh, last issue, the, the, the collection, collection of money. Uh, uh, what do you, would you think about the idea that uh, you know, when you, when they are ethnic, uh, you know, 
ethnic diverse backgrounds and they kind of join this and they kind of associate it with the kind of they get some some connection to the temple in Jerusalem and, and the, the cult around there and that the, it, it's kind of a symbolic continuation of the temple tax perhaps? It's, it's definitely possible and, uh, and it's been argued. Um, so there, yeah, there are kind of different schools of thought. Some, some people see it as the Gentiles being kind of brought into the, you know, this big Jewish mystery and brought into the worship of, an, of the national god. And so there are, there are different schools of thought on it. <coughs> so there's, um, in the Old Testament, it talks about how at, at the end of days, Gentiles will kind of come to Jerusalem. So people read it as, as meaning that. I'm not sure. I really, I wanted to read it as having something to do with like a trade route or establishing connections, but I can't do that and I can't pass my thesis if I propose that because there's absolutely no evidence, so I've left it alone. But I don't know, this is a, it's, it's really interesting to me as to what on earth would convince a Gentile to give money to Jerusalem, but I don't have a great answer. <laughs> I have some possible answers, but I don't know for sure. So I guess, let me come back to the previous question. A Judean is someone who inhabits the land of Judah. Okay. Who may not be Jew, who may not be following the Hebrew religion, right? Um, yeah, it's connected to the land in the same way that if you say in Egyptoi, it would be somebody who's connected to Egypt. But even right. if you meet them in Rome, they might still be called Egyptoi. In Delos, we have Egyptians or whatever. So in that way, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a, it's a hodgepodge of identity, right? It, it is a connection to the land, but it's hard to say what that connection but, is. But your but, use of the term Jews implies the religion of, of Judaism, the religion yeah. of the Hebrews, right? Yeah. Um, I, I simplified it. I, I follow a lot of the literature in my field, which is kind of doing away with talking about a Jewish religion at this point in time. Um, it's common to say now that the Jewish religion, as we understand it, came out of a dialectic with Christianity. Um, and then there's also a field of religious studies which says we can't even talk about religion in antiquity because that's a creation of modern Protestant kind of formations. And anyways, I won't get into that. But um, in, in short, I, I kind of use the word Jews because that's what we know um, and that's what people are familiar with. Um, but I am thinking of it as having this, this meaning of bigger than just religion as being Connection connected to a kind of national national identity as well. Another short question is: Are Algadis related in any way to Astarte? Yes. Yeah. Is she um, one? Is she Astarte? Or one? No, no. There, it's it's kind of emerging. It's um, if, if you done like if you follow Near Eastern deities at all, and I'm, I'm not an expert in the subject because it's hard to follow. Um, but there are definitely I, I start goes a lot further back, and it's very right. Phoenician too. Um, but at some point, there's some kind of different mergings of the two. Um, to get kind of what we have after Gaddis, but then obviously on Delos we're seeing another merging into the Syrian goddess and into Aphrodite, and so she's taking on these new forms again, and she eventually ends up in Rome. So Nero apparently worships worships the Syrian goddess for a little while. So it's just constantly evolving. There's a constant shift in uh, in her identity. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Yes, I have a question as well. I was wondering, in connection with tolerance and so on. Do you have any evidence, either epigraphical or documentary, which might show whether the people that you call members of the community of the Syrian goddess were also members of some other sanctuary on Dios, <coughs> for example? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there are some of the names. I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, there are only one or two of the names that actually come up. And as I said, the, the word member is a bit of a red herring. I use it because, yes. but really, if they're on an inscription, does that mean they came every week, or does that mean they were there once and left an inscription, right? We really don't know. So it wasn't disjunctive in any way. If you, you had to be only a member oh, of no, 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 I don't think so. Um, I think we definitely see people, we see some people going back and forth. Um, and at the very least, we see the, the nomina of the people in, in the, the Romans in the sanctuary of the Syrian goddess pop up in different places in the collegia as well. So whether these are family members or a slave and a master over here, I don't know. But um, people were well connected and moving across. And also there are um, priests from other sanctuaries at one point um, who are worshipping, who show up in our inscriptions. So mm -hmm. the priests in other sanctuaries at one point are giving money to the Syrian goddess. So it's definitely not a mutually exclusive type of thing. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions, comments? It's a bit an aside, but since you mentioned something about France, I would 
like to draw a parallel. If somebody said that uh, the Roman Empire would turn uh, Christian by 50 AD, you would call that ridiculous. But if you waited another two centuries, it wouldn't be ridiculous anymore. Yeah. So when you say ridiculous, I don't think it's correct word. You can say it's an inexact prediction about the date, but it gives no proof that as a trend, it's ridiculous. At least I didn't hear any proof. No, uh, let me clarify what I said. I was just using that as an example um, to say that when I was a kid, I remember somebody telling me that by 2020, France would be Muslim, which is obviously not the case. And either way, I mean, that's not really what I'm talking about. I think I just use that as an example to show that these issues of religion and ethnicity are still important. And, and one way or another, whether that's true or not is not really the point. The point is that people imagine that that's the case or not the case. So the point is that we're still thinking about this stuff. So obviously religion and migration are closely connected still in some way today um, and will probably continue to be going forward. That's all I meant by that, not to say anything about whether or not the Islamification of Europe is a thing. I leave that aside. I'm, that's not my area. As you've seen, that's not my area. <laughs> With your conclusions, do you find that you have new questions you'd like to explore in the future? Ah, good question. Um, I think one of the things that I'd be most interested about as I study diaspora communities are the ways that they're really tied together. So I'll give you an example, not from my research here, but from papyri. Um, so in Egypt, we have a group of Syrians. It's called the Syrian Village, this military settlement in Egypt. But that label Syrian Villages actually has within it um, Jews, it has, um, I think, Edomites, Phoenicians, Syrians, all these groups come together under one label. So I really got curious over the proximity of migrants to one another, or immigrants to one another. Same as we have in the Piraeus here in ancient Athens, we have all the immigrants kind of in the same place. And I'm interested in the way that immigrants kind of rubbed off on each other with their <coughs> cultural practices, as it were. But I don't know too much about that, but that's something I'd like to pursue in the future. Thanks. Last question, comment? Certainly, identity is formed in crisis, in the sense that uh, if you see other people who are different and they think you're different, you have to explain yourself, and in some cases you uh, end up adopting uh, things that are maybe true about your identity or what the other person thinks you are. And so um, um, I would be interested in um, to what extent the practice in Heropolis, whether they would believe would, how they saw what's happening in Delos, as, um, <clears throat> whether they are following uh, the religion properly or uh, whether they have developed. Because certainly in North America, um, the, the variety of Judaism in Israel, it's not always, you're not a Jew. Even though the people in North America, reform, what have you, consider themselves Jews. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, uh, yeah. at what point the diaspora creates a yeah. totally different... Uh, hybridity again. A hybridity, a different religion, yeah. which still bears as the same yeah. label, but not... Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And then, of course, with, with the, the issue of modern Jews, we also have the recreation the state of Israel. So once again, it's about land, which it wasn't for a while, I mean, before the Zionist movement. So now all of a sudden we're asking some of these questions again about diaspora and its connection to home. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting, I'm, I'm always fascinated by it, both modern and ancient, and uh, diaspora is a really interesting thing. So. From the looks of it, we will not be lacking in diaspora in the future. <laughs> better or worse. Okay, uh, thank you very much for a very stimulating <laughs> talk. And, uh,